1985, you and Tommy Chong went your separate ways. Yeah. What happened? I got sick of each other. I mean, you know, really, that's what it was. Mm-hmm. You know, we got, you're, you're in a team, and it's a tough thing to do. It's just that, you know, because you have to compromise so much. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, you get, you've had a lot of success. And eh, I don't listen to that crap anymore. What did you feel you had to compromise? Uh, well, you know, t- Tommy had the, he's older than I am. He's eight years older. And he always assumed that he was the leader of the group. The group is two guys, you know, and it was, it was an older brother, younger brother syndrome. And so, you know, the older brother knows more and he's been around more, he's had more experience than the younger brother. All of a sudden the younger brother gets old enough. You know, I, I, I want to drive for a little while. You know, I don't necessarily want to drive all the time, but, you know, this thing I want to drive because I know where, it's, where we're going. And that was a clash. And so... Uh, you wanting some autonomy to, to take just, some know, control? Yeah, I just, you know, as I had to, I had to, you know, I was old enough where I just, <laughs> you know, I, I, don't, I don't need to have get your permission anymore. This is, come on, let's do it this way. No, right. No, you know, and it's I, it's one of those deals. So after you guys parted ways, you began your solo mm-hmm. film career. As an actor, how important was it to you not to be typecast as a stoner? I, the, 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 the criterion to do any, any project after that was it didn't, couldn't have a big joint in it anywhere. <laughs> you know, that, was, <laughs> that, that was the only prerequisite. That was the only thing that was necessary. I couldn't have a big joint in it. And so, you know, the, 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 problem, or the, 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 the problem was how to become Cheech is like how to become Cher of Sonny and Cher without Sonny and how to become Cheech without Chong. Sure. It's a whole different identification. So you, you said about it, you know, one, uh, one gig at a time. And you did a lot of TV and film. You co-starred with Don Johnson in Nash Bridges yeah. on CBS. And more recently, you had a recurring role on Lost, yeah. which I really enjoyed. I loved Lost. Yeah, what a was, fantastic yeah. show. The, the, the best thing about it was sitting in the makeup trailer and listening to everybody's storylines. Because I didn't necessarily watch the show all that much. And so and I was listening, well, how is this, you know, because along with everybody else who was watching the show, well, how did you get there and how's this? How do you really, how would, you know, how, how are you still working when you died two weeks ago? Right, right. You know, <laughs> some complex stuff. Yeah. And I go, I said, well, uh, uh, um, Carlton Cuse, who was the executive producer and head writer of Lost, was also the head pro- writer and producer of Last Bridges. Okay. So that's how I got on the show. Wow. They called me up and said, hey, we got this part for you. Come on over to Hawaii. And do oh, okay. Whatever. So, and so, okay, what's, what's my deal? Okay, here it is. And, uh, and, but listening to everybody's convoluted storyline, like, wow. Now, did you ever watch the show? After that, yes. I started doing like, oh, Okay. And 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 they were all the actors really wanted to tell you their storyline because they were figuring it out themselves. Sure, you know. And and the, the great thing about a big ensemble show like that is that you get up and you die. That's right. <laughs> all of a sudden, he got sucked into the vortex. That's right. Again. That's right. <laughs> so you got to be well behaved. Yeah, yeah. In that makeup chair, you played Hurley's father, yeah, Hurley's of course. Father, yeah. Uh, and then you appeared in more than 20 films, uh, Spy Kids, Once Upon a Time in Mexico, The Perfect Game, uh, Tin Cup. Yeah. Uh, you voiced a whole bunch of Disney films. Speaking of Tin Cup, I read that you're an avid golfer, but I that am. you disliked the sport until you co-starred in Tin Cup. I didn't dislike it. I just hadn't played it. I played a couple times when I was a kid, you know, with my teenage buddies. Hey, let's go out and play golf. Okay. Uh, but no, I didn't dislike it. I just didn't play it. And so when I got I on the Tin Cup, wow, this is, hey. And, I, and it was something I could do with my son. My son was just turning 10 at the time. And so we learned lo- golf together, and that was great. Well, I guess I need to star in Tin Cup in order to, to change my mind. I just, I, I've never been, I, I took golf lessons as yeah. a kid, but. Yeah. It never clicked for me, and I always remember what George Carlin said about golf. Um, it's like watching flies. F- <laughs> <laughs> so that's always stayed with me. And uh, golf is the greatest game in the world. All right, I've played all the games. I'll take your word for golf it. Golf is the greatest I'm, game. It, it, it's a Zen game. It really, is a Zen game, and you don't realize it until you're like ten years into it. So you are also an art collector, yes. which is why you're out here on the That's East End. You have the largest private collection of Chicano art in the world. Okay. Uh, you've had two national touring exhibitions featuring works from your collection. How'd you get into this? Well, you know, I was, I was uh, 
self-educated in art from a very early age. From 11, I, I was really interested in art because I grew up Catholic and looking, oh, there's art. You know, art has to have you know, guys with robes on. You know, I got, that was my <laughs> first, first impression. Right. And, and so, but I started learning about art and I'd go to the library and I'd take out all the art books and just to look at the pictures. You know, oh, Picasso, that's weird. How come the eyes are over there and the nose is there? And, uh, and, uh, and I, so I, I, I educated myself in art through, through the art books. And I was always interested, and so I, I, you know, when I got to the point where I actually could buy art, when I had some money from Cheech and Chong, I started, uh, I just wanted to discover these Chicano artists. And I go, wow, these guys are really good, because I, mean, I knew what great art was, because I'd seen it all my life. And I go, how come they're not, nobody, ever, the whole world doesn't know about this, you know? So I started buying Chicano art, and I started amassing this collection, and some, one of my friends said, you got to show this stuff, you know? And I go, well, how do you, how do you do that? So I went about the process of how to put together an art show. So now, <laughs> I don't, I'm, you know, 20 years later, over, to, I'm, I've done, I've done big traveling national tour art shows, and, the, and what I'm here in the Hamptons doing at Art Hampton, which opens uh, Friday, is is uh, 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 turning the East Coast onto Chicano art because they don't know mm-hmm. what a Chicano is, much less what their art looks like. But uh, Chicanos and Mexican Americans are the largest Latino group in the in the in the nation. I, I'm I'm really fascinated by uh, not only by how you became an art collector, but also the impact that. It, you, it had on your life and your identity. Oh, yeah. um, ha- has becoming a collector of Chicano art influenced or changed the way you think about your own identity? Oh yeah, yeah. It's you know, <laughs> the art of being Chicano is the art of uncovering your sophistication, because you know you've had it buried or layered in other images before, and it's the art yes. of stripping that away. Uh, Chicano art is inc- it's incredibly sophisticated. It's sophisticated and naive simultaneously. And these Chicano artists use very sophist- uh, naive symbols in a very sophisticated manner because they're all university and or art school trained. Mm-hmm. So they're exposed to world art. They know what they're talking about. What does it mean to you to be Chicano and, and why is it important to you? Well, Chicano, it, originally the term was a derisive term by Mexicans to other Mexicans living in this country. The concept being that the Mexicans live Living in the, the Mexicanos, living in this country, were no longer truly Mexicanos because they had left their country. They were something less. They were smaller. They were chicos, ah, chicanos, I see. little Mexican, little cheese fried Mexicans. You know, <laughs> cheese fried Mexicans. <laughs> you know, living over here in, in tin shacks along the border. So it was an insult. Yeah, you tested Chicanos. You know, and and. And but after after a while, the Chicanos took it on as a badge of pride. Yeah, I am a Chicano. I'm from here. I speak and I'm English. proud. I'm proud of it. You know, and so that's how it evolved. So as your collection began to take shape, and as you began learning more and more about Chicano art. Did you discover more about your family's heritage, your own family story? Well, you know, part of the process of being Chicano, because by and large, Chicanos don't speak Spanish. <laughs> they're influenced by Spanish. They're, yes. They're, they're like swimming in a mole sauce, but they don't, you know, <laughs> they hear it all the time. But I, and that was me. You know, I didn't, I couldn't speak Spanish. I could kind of, you know, I knew, I knew what they were talking about because mm-hmm. they would try to speak Spanish in front of me when they don't want me to know what they're talking about, uh, but I, I could get it, you know, so but at some point I said, I got to learn more Spanish, so I did, but uh, uh, you, you, uh, the definition of Chicano art is Mexican traditional, which is a very long traditional art, uh, meets American pop, yeah. and where those two things clash and join and fuse and, and create something new that's, that's neither of those, but even greater than the whole, it's a gestalt, that, that uh, uh, Chicano art is born. So did it allow you to take ownership of being Chicano? Did it allow you to feel connected with others? Uh, Did it give you a sense of belonging? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because the Chicano political movement started in the late 60s. It was a part of the Chicano Civil Rights Movement. And the artists were the the face, the the graphic face of that movement. And it was at at first very political art, evolved into other kinds of art. But yeah, it was, it was like, yes, we're Chicanos and we're, and we're here and, you know, we're we're queer and we're here, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Right. I know those are all very NPR-ish questions, but I I, 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 I appreciate you indulging me. The thing is, is there was a statistic uh, released by the Department of Statistics or whatever uh, a couple of months ago that, and this is a great one. 50.6% 50.6% of all children born in this country under the age of one are Latino. 50.6% of the majority. 